you very much. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for having me here today. Um, so I'm the CTO for Gumtree. I've been at Gumtree for uh, just coming up for 10 months now, so still relatively new to the team. Um, obviously, as you can tell from my accent, I'm Irish, so I originally lived in Sydney a few years ago, moved back to Ireland for a few years, and had weather like this basically every day. So decided that I'd be better off back here. So moved back about two years ago. So first of all, I should point out that I'm absolutely no expert on diversity. So um, I don't know why I keep getting asked about this, but apparently it's a thing about women in tech. Um, and so for uh, the whole of my career, which is about 20 years, um, for most of that time, I've been the only woman on the team. So I don't know why people think I'd be the expert in women in technology. Um, so I started out as a software engineer. Um, I've been in various different roles uh, over my 20 years. Um, and I've worked with lots of different teams all over the world. So I've worked with teams in the UK, in Ireland, in Poland, in the US, in China, in India, in New Zealand, and Australia, and other countries. Um, so I've had quite a lot of experience with working with different teams. Um, and so when I, my proposal was accepted for this talk, I thought, oh, well, I should actually go and do some reading about this topic and try and figure out um, you know, what is the information that's out there right now. So um, kind of like some of the other people today, um, James and Lindsay did quite a lot of research and reading academic papers. I did the same over the last couple of weeks. And so my presentation is way longer than half an hour, so I'm going to try and talk really quickly to get through it. Um, but I actually learned an amazing amount that I didn't realize and didn't know about diverse teams. So I hope you guys will actually learn something as well today. So. Um, we'll start off by looking at um, a definition of diversity, and I know lots of people have kind of their own idea as to what it is, so we'll start with the definition. It's a bit of a hot topic um, at the moment, as you can probably um, understand or realize, um, but does it really live up to the hype? Um, we're also going to look at how it actually works. So how does diversity change the way your team um, works together? How does it affect performance? How does it affect cohesion? Um, and attrition and recruitment and everything else. So we're going to look at the different types of categories of um, diversity as well and how the different categories actually impact team behavior. And by the end of my session, hopefully you'll be able to know what the four different types of diverse teams are, what challenges they face, um, what work you should assign to them, and how you can get the best performance out of those teams. So we said we'd start with the definition. Um, I like this one because it's, it's pretty simple. It's actually the de dictionary definition of diversity, which is difference, variation, and unlikeness. Um, and it seems like a very simple definition for a very complex um, uh, subject. Um, Williams and O'Reilly in 1998 defined it as any attribute that another person may use to detect individual differences. So. This definition is quite broad, and as I said, it's quite a complex subject, so we'll need to get down into a little bit more detail on the different categories of diversity and things like that if we're going to actually understand how we can use it to best um, get, the, get the best performance out of our teams. And while we're at it, because the two kind of go together quite often, I wanted to include a definition of inclusion as well. Um, and so the dictionary definition of inclusion is just the action or state of including or being included in a group. But you could also think of inclusion as being kind of accepted or res and respected in spite of or because of um, your diversity. So it is definitely a hot topic, um, and it's in the news, um, uh, fairly topical at the moment in the media, uh, when it comes to particularly women in tech. And the news isn't always posit positive, as we've seen with Uber and Google alone this year. Um, and I do get off asked quite often, like, how do we actually encourage more women into technology in particular? How do we get more girls into STEM careers? And how do we get more women into senior leadership positions? Um, and to be honest, the diversity question and solution are um, not that easy to solve. It's a lot more complicated than you might think. And it goes way beyond just gender diversity. So let's start, however, with some stats. So many of you may have seen this infographic already, but basically a lot of companies now, particularly Fortune 500 companies, are starting to share their um, diversity stats. Um, this is a terrible screen grab of a really good infographic, so I'd encourage you to go and actually find the infographic, because it's very hard to actually show all the information here. Um, but for example, at eBay, we've got 43% female, 57% um, male, and you kind of think, geez, that's not so bad. 
we're actually doing okay when you compare that to the overall US population. So, you know, what is the problem? Um, and so the problem is that at first glance, this looks not too bad, particularly on the gender diversity side, not so much on the racial diversity side, but it doesn't actually show the real picture. And when you actually start digging a bit deeper and start looking at what percentage of those are actually technical roles that women are in, it's quite a small percentage. So as low as 10% in some companies. So what's the big deal? Hasn't it always kind of been like that? Um, the industry is booming, um, like as a female or a male leader in technology, do I actually need to do anything about it? Um, should I actually prioritize something like this? Um, and so let's have a look at some of the studies that have been done just to see if there is any actual benefit to the business. Um, and so you, some of you may have already seen these two reports. There was a report by McKinsey in 2015 and a more recent one by Credit Suisse Research Institute, and both of them have resoundingly um, said, yes, there is a business and a financial benefit to having diversity in your teams. Um, and I, I'm not going to go through all of these because my slides are too long, but um, there, one that really kind of stands out for me is that companies with at least one woman on the board have outperformed their peer group with no women the, on the board by 26% over the last six years. So clearly there's a financial benefit. But where is that coming from? How does that actually happen? So, um, when you look at this, you might think, okay, that sounds pretty awesome. I'll add a couple of Indians, maybe a couple of Chinese to my team. I'll put a women, woman on the board and then sit back, relax, and watch the money roll in. Um, but that's not actually how it actually works. Um, so there's been lots of studies um, done on this, um, quite a lot actually, over the last 50 years, um, which I was surprised to see. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail out there. Um, and what are the, uh, one common factor in a lot of these studies is that the conclusion they've come to is that diversity makes us uncomfortable. And so this discomfort is not actually a bad thing. So it's actually the unease with differences that enables engineers to actually um, come together and work and solve a complex problem. So diverse teams are much more likely to re-examine the facts um, and remain objective, and they're constantly, um, uh, what's the word? They're scrutinizing each other's actions. So, um, I'll skip that one. Um, scientists think that basically diverse teams outperform homogenous ones in decision making because they process information much more caref carefully. So in other words, the presence of a majority opinion tends to lead to convergent thinking, and the presence of a minority op opinion is what um, uh, generates divergent thinking. And it's actually the divergent thinking, so looking at an issue from multiple perspectives, that actually results in the, d the debate and the constructive conflict that leads you to the correct outcome. So that's kind of the secret sauce behind diversity. So um, there was another relatively big study done in 1999 where they looked at 92 different functioning groups um, to see what the impact of diversity was on those teams. And in order to do that, they had to categorize diversity into uh, they use three different categories, three different buckets. And we tend to think about diversity as the top one there, which is the social category. So um, they're the kind of explicit, very obvious differences. So race, gender, age, those kinds of things. Um, they also categorize something called informational diversity, which is that, you know, what you generally have in your cross-functional team. So you have people with um, different skill sets, different educations, uh, maybe different lengths of tenure at the company, um, yeah, different skills and expertise. And then you have value diversity. So that's um, things like different religious beliefs, different political beliefs, um, things like that, uh, and value differences. So the, um, what the studies actually found from, from these different types of categories is that they each had a different effect on group processes and outcomes. So for example, informational diversity increased task conflict. So that's the one in the middle there. So that's the one that increased task conflict. And as we've already seen, that positively impacts performance, um, which is what you'd expect. Social category diversity positively inc um, influenced group members' morale. And 
um, value diversity actually decreased member satisfaction, intent to remain, and commitment to the group. So a very th three very different impacts of those three different types of diversity on your team's performance. Um, so there was another model put forward in 1987 that actually showed that organizations naturally evolved towards a state of homogeneity through a process of attraction, selection, and attrition. In other words, in your team, your team members are more likely to attract people that look like them, they're more likely to select them for promotion, and they're more likely to stay if they look like them. And people who do not look like them are more likely to leave the group. So just being aware of that may help you manage your teams a little bit more effectively. So what should those teams look like? So um, let's say you had 100 engineers, and um, you had recently hired 10 female developers. So you're dead chuffed with yourself. You've got 10 females on your team, and now you have to figure out where you're going to put them. And so you're uh, organization is doing agile, somebody told you that 10 is a good size for a team, and so you were pretty much thinking that um, the best way to set them up is to assign one female to each team. So you have 10 teams, each with one woman on them, and I don't laugh, I've seen this, uh, each with one woman on each team. And voila, you've got 10 diverse teams, and you know diversity is good for business. So again, you can sit back, relax. You're totally going to get that bonus. Everything's going good. Um, there was an, a, a book written by a woman called Rosabeth Cantor in 1977. Um, and she argued that the proportion of in-group and out-group members matters a lot when looking at the effect of proportions on outcomes. So in-group is. Um, all the people that you consider to be the same as you. So an outgroup is um, the people who you don't consider to be the same as you. So it's quite a broad kind of description of it, but effectively, um, you know, all female en engineers are in my in-group, and then all male engineers would be in my outgroup, for example. Um, interestingly enough, um, another study showed that people, when they're describing their own in-group, um, describe it as being more diverse than people in an outgroup looking in. So, for example, female engineers. I think on our team of female engineers, we've got um, different cultural backgrounds, different countries, different languages, different um, skill sets. We've got front engine engineers, back end engineers, we've got Irish, we've got all sorts of different um, age groups and levels. But for the outgroup looking in, we're a bunch of female engineers. So that's where the kind of um, imbalance can actually happen. Um, so Cantor, getting back to this uh, study by Cantor, she actually defined four different group um, types or team types. Uniform, skewed, tilted, and balanced. Um, in uniform groups, all members share the same external status. So they all have that same in-group. Um, and so their, her study was actually um, very much aligned with the social category diversity group. So it was um, age, gender, um, racial um, diversity. In skewed groups, a minor minority member has membership of between 1 and 15%. In a tilted group, it's between 15 and 35%. And in a balanced group, it's somewhat in parity, so somewhere between 35 and 65%. In her um, book, it was her theory that um, the skewed group was actually the one that um, was the most problematic. Um, and that was because the group would have effectively a token minority group member who was more likely, much more likely to be subjected to stereotyping, isolation, and exclusion. So these teams generally struggled to hold on to their minority team member, but not only that, they didn't benefit from having the diversity within their team because they didn't have that inclusion within the team. So um, another, interestingly enough, another study actually showed that there was a problem with balanced teams. So what they found in certain circumstances was that where the majority group felt under threat or a loss of power, the minority group um, ha faced increasing hostility and discrimination, which can also ex you know, go towards explaining why some balanced groups are actually extremely dysfunctional as well. OK, so in our case, we could assign three females to um, one, 
to two of the teams. Remember, we had 10 females and 100 engineers. We could put three females on two teams and two females on another two teams, which would mean we'd have four tilted teams, which we can see from Cantor's um, study, it seems to be the most um, uh, high performing. Um, but we also have six uniform teams. So one other study actually showed that um, when you have large groups um, and you have lots of diversity within that large group, this can actually lead to factions. So what you end up with in a large group, even though it seems like it's diverse or it's balanced or it's tilted, when the group is too large, you end up with factions. And so it, it ends up with small uniform groups that don't bridge with the other members of the group. So keeping the team small is actually another way to kind of maximize the performance of your team. So what do you do with your six uniform teams then? So it turns out that most organizations have different types of work that they're doing and different types of teams are better suited to the different types of work. And this comes down to um, a couple of things. It comes down to the level of um, uh, conflict within the team, constructive conflict within the team, and the speed and efficiency of communication. So in uniform groups, there tends to be more speed and efficiency in communication. And so if you look at the two different types of work that you could assign the team, um, exploitation tasks tend to build on what's already known within an organization, so existing products, existing markets, things like that. Um, and where you want a team that's focused on production, efficiency, um, convergent thinking so you can get to decisions quickly um, and execute quickly, then uniform teams may actually be the right solution for your team or for your business. And then for exploration tasks where you need that divergent thinking, you need to get to innovative solutions, then um, diverse teams actually perform better. So, and that's uh, exploitation tasks are things like experimenting, innovating, divergent thinking, and general problem solving. Okay, so that's all very good. We've got, we've got our diverse teams set up. Um, we know now what work we're gonna assign them. You've put your teams together, um, and you've got you know, however many diverse teams set up. Um, but if you're not seeing um, an increase in performance, what could possibly be going wrong on your team? So it turns out that in order, again, to get the, the, the best out of your diverse teams, you actually need to create a culture of inclusion and um, openness so that those minority opinions actually get heard. Because there's no point in having diversity in, in your team if you can't have the discussion and those minority voices can't speak up. So having a shared vision or goal can, um, has been shown to reduce the negative effects of diversity on um, performance. So in particular, values diversity. So if you've got a group of individuals who can't decide whether Trump should be president or not, give them a shared goal that they work towards for that team and they forget all the other differences. So concentrate on the things that they have in common, give them a shared goal and they can work towards that. Team culture is incredibly important and having shared values within the team is also incredibly important. So having a, um, a team or an environment of psychological safety so that team members feel that they can speak up. Um, uh, somebody mentioned a, um, a team, uh, I think it was a team charter or something in one of the talks earlier, um, but having a team manifesto is actually a great way of doing this. Getting all of the team together, getting them to sit down and say, what are the things that we agree we're going to do as a team? We're, we agree everyone has a voice, everyone um, can speak up, um, and we agree on the common set of values and behaviors that are acceptable for our team. So team manifesto is a great way of doing that, particularly for new teams. Um, building bridges is another one. Um, so we talked about that earlier to prevent factions, if you can, um, to get team members to um, concentrate on the stuff that they have in common. So again, if you've got a very diverse team, do we have you know a subset of people who enjoy running or you know board games or whatever it is? Concentrate on the things that they have in common. Um, 
Forming coalitions is an interesting one, particularly when you may have skewed teams. So forming a coalition just essentially, um, there was a study done by Mugni and Papastamau in 1980. I'm not sure that I'm actually pronouncing that correctly. Um, but what they found was that the disagreement of one minority member can be discounted as idiosyncratic, but the consistent disagreement of two could not so easily be dismissed. And the team lead plays a huge role in this and actually acting as an advocate for the minority or dissenting view. So if your team lead actually steps in and forms a coalition with the dissenting voice, it actually allows the team to get more information out onto the table and it might actually lead to better outcomes for the team. Um, finally, um, well, two more things. Uh, the performance management is another thing. Um, uh, people within your in-group are more likely to be promoted or even recruited within your in-group. So it's very important to realize that, particularly when you've got um, maybe layers of management that are not as diverse as your teams. So um, calling out that bias is actually there. You're much more likely to, to uh, promote somebody within your in-group. So spread out the decisioning around um, performance management. Um, so communication is another one. Um, I was delighted when we sat down earlier and we were asked to stand up and talk to the person next to us. And uh, I figured out it was a woman from Galway. Uh, there she is. <laughs> so we said, what are the chances of two Irish women happen to be sitting beside each other for this talk? Um, but it's, I would say Sheena and I are in the same in-group. So even though I only met her like five minutes ago, we could have a conversation in half sentences and I'd know exactly what she was talking about. When you're communicating in your own in-group, it's very easy to communicate. It's very slick, it's easy. There's, you have the same cultural references. So when you're communicating across um, in-groups or in a diverse team, you have to be aware that some of those cultural clues um, might be missing or cultural references might be missing. Um, there might be um, body language clues that you're not picking up on. So you really need to double down on communication when you're in a diverse team. And it's about kind of re-acknowledging, um, active listening, making sure that you've, you've got a mutual understanding of a problem. Um, yeah. Okay, quick recap. How much time have I got left? A few minutes. Okay, so we talked about um, three different types of diversity, um, and each has a different impact on your team. Um, team structures, so there's uh, four different types, um, uniform, skewed, tilted, and balanced, and each of, the, each of these can have an impact on your team performance. Um, one of the main challenges that it appears to be in any group setting is that organizations tend towards homogene homogeneity um, through uh, attraction, selection, and attrition. In other words, you attract the people who look like you, you promote the people who look like you, and you're more likely to lose the people who don't. Okay, so some of the solutions then. Picking the right team structure, um, uh, building bridges across the team, assigning the team a particular types of tasks, exploration tasks, exploitation tasks. Um, having strong organizational values, uh, goals and culture can override the negative impact of um, values or belief diversity on the team. And trust and inclusion appear to be the two biggest factors in creating high performing diverse teams. So it's not enough to just create a diverse team, you have to create the culture that enables that divergent thinking to happen and that drives the high performance. Um, okay, so any questions?